morning, Harold. Perhaps I should say good morning, Harold J. Brennan, Dean Emeritus of the College of Fine and Applied Art, and Dean Emeritus, Dean, Director Emeritus of the School of American Craft. Uh, I have already told you a little bit about our oral history project, in which we're interviewing some of the old timers who made significant contributions to the Institute over a long period of time. And I'm looking forward today, particularly, to chatting with you about the history of the School of American Craftsmen and the things that you remembered about the Institute and even before uh, the school came to RIT. So why don't you uh, presume that I'm a newcomer to Rochester and you're bringing me up to date with the School of American Craftsmen. All right, go ahead. Well, you know, this uh, interview comes at a rather uh, interesting uh, time for me because <clears throat> I reread only a few moments before beginning this the uh, article on the 20th anniversary of Shop One that was in the Upstate uh, magazine section of last Sunday's Democrat and Chronicle, in which uh, some uh, extraordinary tributes are paid to the School for American Craftsmen and uh, the faculty and student body of the school uh, because of the contribution artistically and culturally that the school made through Shop One uh, to the community of, uh, of Rochester and the people who are interested in the arts uh, here. We like to feel that uh, through the opportunities that the Institute provided the school growth and influence, that we have uh, managed to do a great deal for the uh, people with whom we live. <clears throat> I'm sure you're correct, and I know that you've also brought to RIT a new class that uh, certainly uh, kept up the whole institution. Well, I uh, have taken the uh, opportunity, Leo, to make uh, uh, some uh, notes <clears throat> on the questions that you sent me. Which, uh, will uh, move through later. But in preparation for that, I chose to uh, write just a brief statement in the interest of uh, precision and getting uh, something in the way of exactitude uh, in the record that I fear might escape us. We just carried on with this uh, conversation and you permitted me to uh, talk the way I usually talk, which is a highly random sort of fashion. Uh, joining uh, the Rochester Institute of Technology for me came about as a result of the coming of the School for American Craftsmen to the Institute in 1950, a union that strengthened and enriched both. The School for American Craftsmen had been a wanderer for the preceding four years, having been affiliated with Dartmouth College for one of those years and with Alfred University for three. <clears throat> the school had not been educationally or physically comfortable in either of these institutions. It was only after becoming a part of the Institute that fulfillment of its hopes and goals became possible. The climate at RIT was right. For years, the Institute of Philosophy had accepted the premise that creative and constructive skills were of educational and social value. There was no problem of acceptance of the school's program or its people. There were four reasons for this, I think. <clears throat> the first, the Institute had always had a core concept of craft and of skill as being a necessary attribute of human effectiveness. And two, the Department of Art and Design had been a part of the program offered by the Institute and its predecessor institution the Athenaeum and Mechanics Institute for many years. <clears throat> and three, the people at RIT were friendly, open, and generous in their welcome of us as members of the educational family. And four, Rochester was ready for and needed the kind of spirit and levels of creative competence present in the School for American Craftsmen's faculty and student body. Because when the School for American Craftsmen came to Rochester in 1950, there was only a mild interest in contemporary art. In the minds of most of the community, art was to be seen as music is heard, not produced and consumed. 
the School for American Craftsmen changed that. Uh, through the influence of its faculty and students, through Shop One, about which I spoke just a moment ago, this shop was set up to provide a local outlet for the creative production of the faculty and some of the more gifted students. <clears throat> I might add that it also changed the institute and the values and views of the RIT community. And much more substantially than the size of the newcomers would suggest, or the size of number of the newcomers would suggest. On the other hand, the people and philosophy of the Institute influenced the School of American Craftsmen. Extraordinary personality, ideas, an example of Mark Ellingson, who offered the department heads considerable encouragement in their search for improvement through new approaches or harder work through older ones. I better harder work through older ones. Ralph Tyler, the likes of whom I've never met before in close range. <clears throat> a kind of Marshall Montgomery in the field of educational warfare. And Leo Smith, yourself, who did so much to rationalize, clarify, and unify programs of study. Upgrade faculty in Sanders. <clears throat> Bring the better business of academe to our IT. Was a kind word. <laughs> Well, you were always concerned about the improvement of faculty, the improvement of programs, the constant uh, study and examination of what we were doing. And I think that uh, in all modesty, we ought to recognize it, that you probably can't give yourself a radio credit. So I'm going to try to give you some. You can always be erased, you know. <laughs> It is a history now, not, not often popular, <clears throat> but in the 1950s, the School for American Craftsmen, its students and faculty, won two Guggenheims, Wilden Hain and Meyer, <clears throat> four Fulbright Fellowships, and in most years, about half the awards at the annual Finger Lakes Exhibition at the Memorial Art Gallery, <clears throat> including the Jurors Award, on five occasions. <clears throat> The jurors awarded the, is the top prize awarded at those annual, the annual figure like shows <clears throat> by Toza Radakovich, a student. I remember that. <clears throat> <It's a key. laughs> I'm sorry. Julia Brown, who was a she. <clears throat> Franz Bowden, Toza Radakovich, and Julia Brown were students in one of the jurors. Uh, Franz Wildenheim, member of the faculty, <coughs> Wendell Gassel, a member of the faculty, and Ronald, Ronald Pearson, a graduate. <coughs> In addition to the Guggenheim, Franz Wildenheim won the Fairchild Award for his ceramic mural, the foyer of the Strasbourg Laboratories. <coughs> this <coughs> award is given for the most important work of the creative imagination produced in the preceding year. <clears throat> so far as I know, this is the first time that the Fairchild Award, and it may have been the only time the uh, award was won by anyone from the Institute. Now, this is particularly gratifying because it's the award, really, of the University of Rochester. <clears throat> so it's a it was a particularly satisfying, satisfying achievement. <clears throat> So it was that the School of American Craft came to Rochester, the School of American Craftsman came to Rochester, and to the Institute as a new department for the opening of the summer session in June 1950. <clears throat> Our first appearance in Rochester had been made in the show or exhibition of work by students and faculty in the Bevere Gallery the preceding winter. I don't know whether you remember that that we went to considerable effort to assemble an exhibition which has been recorded. I took a number of color slides. And all this material, by the way, has been put in the archives in the slide collection, actually. Oh, great. Of uh, the RIT Library, Wallace Memorial Library. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I think I left about 3,000 or 3,500 color slides in the 
now for two years, documenting this exhibition initially, other exhibitions, and the work of students and faculty. <clears throat> well, we had a good introduction to the uh, Rochester community with that show. It was uh, very well reviewed. Uh, it uh, pleased because of the quality of the show and the people who saw it. And with that, we really got off to a good start. <clears throat> as far as uh, interest on the part of the community and the Institute family was concerned in the programs of the school. <clears throat> we were made welcome and it was recognized as a school of American press. Probably had a future in Rochester. Well, Harold, uh, there are uh, two or three anecdotes. I would like to have you enlarge on uh, some of these. Uh, one, I would like to hear a little bit more about uh, Mrs. Vanderbilt Webb and her interest in improving the status of American crafts. I know that you know that story very well and how the craft school originally had to get started in New Hampshire. In the well, <clears throat> it, it's a long story. <clears throat> And only a part of it really is related to uh, the Institute. And that uh, part would come about as a result of Mrs. Webb's <coughs> sponsoring the school, and then in some fashion or other making the contacts with Mark. Uh, I don't know exactly how that was done, although I have some strong suspicions as to how, how it was done. <coughs> and uh, the uh, <clears throat> consequences, which were the uh, of the meeting of Mark and Mrs. Webb, was Wilson probably arranged. Let me uh, let me tell a little bit about that. Uh, I was uh, serving as a consultant in the state education department, and working under Dr. Carol Newsom, who was associate commissioner for higher education. And one day in his office, he said that he knew of the school, who was from American Craftsman, which was at Alpha. It had not been particularly happy there. He was looking around to make a change. And Mrs. Vanderbilt Webb was the woman who would have been more or less the godmother of this. And Harold Brennan was the director of the school. And if uh, Dr. Ellingson would want to get in touch with Mrs. Webb, he might be able to interest her in the same RIT. Uh, Dr. Newsom said, however, that in no way did he want his name to enter this. In fact, he would deny ever having mentioned this in the conversation. Uh, this particular uh, conversation about this took place in Alton. Uh, I immediately uh, rushed back to the hotel and called uh, Dr. Robinson, who was in New York, and I knew where he was staying. Told him that he would have to figure out a way to get in touch with Mrs. Webb. He replied that any woman that had that much money, he would figure out a way to get in touch with. The uh, result was that he did make contact with Mrs. Webb. She was very much interested. I do not know exactly when she visited the institute, but I do remember a little later that spring that uh, Dr. Ellingson and I went down to Alfred and you met some of the uh, faculty members and uh, had a chance to see the school. And it wasn't too many months uh, following that, that apparently you and Mrs. Webb and Dr. Young reached some sort of a meeting of the minds and the school moved to Well, I vividly remember, of course, that meeting with you and Mark uh, in the spring day <coughs> in Alfred. <coughs> At the time, uh, we were uh, prepared to leave out there. And the story of that, uh, uh, the decision, the, the, the background that led to the decision to move was uh, very, very complicated. <clears throat> and it involved uh, people and uh, the institution. And I, uh, so I prefer not to go into detail on that. But the uh, decision had moved. It had been made, I think, by Mrs. Webb and agreed to by the then president of uh, the University of 
University Alfred, Dr. Jack Walter, <clears throat> and uh, the school is casting about for another home. Someone had suggested Bard College as being a school, uh, Columbia as being a school. Uh, and then in uh, some fashion or other, this Jimmy and he had not given up. But so the contact was made between Mark and uh, Mrs. Webb. And uh, tentative discussions began as to whether or not it would be uh, wise from the standpoint of both the school and the institute for us to join hands. The decision was made, and I think it was extremely fine. But to get back to the uh, origins, <coughs> Mrs. Webb had long been interested in crafts. As a matter of fact, this interest went back to the Depression years. When she and a neighbor of hers in the Hudson River Valley, Mrs. Freeman Roosevelt, became interested in the possibility of turning the skills of some of the people into good account, they felt that those individuals who had skills could use them better uh, making and selling things, which would keep them occupied. And, uh, perhaps uh, selling apples on the street corners or, or uh, waiting for some sort of governmental relief. So <clears throat> they set up a uh, producing unit called the Val Kill Workshops, uh, where the people with uh, abilities uh, in hand skills, manual skills, uh, were uh, making furniture, they uh, were making metal uh, objects, the ceramic objects, <clears throat> and then offering them for sale. And the, as I understand it, the women in the community through bazaars and so forth tried to dispose of the products. That vent, that Val Kill venture was uh, <clears throat> uh, expanded as a result of Mrs. Webb's interest because Mrs. Roosevelt's uh, became uh, national when her husband would have been present. But she continued these interests. You may remember the development of the art of the community in West Virginia and so forth. The notion that these uh, activities that supplemented income were uh, highly useful in certain rural areas and certain uh, mountain areas and so forth. So, <clears throat> Uh, Mrs. Roosevelt pursued her interest, and Mrs. Webb pursued hers. Mrs. Webb's pursuit led her to the establishment of a marketing center in America. There was some legal structure developed. The American Craftsman's Education Council, was called, which was a sort of holding company for the craft enterprises of Mrs. Webb, so began <coughs> with the uh, establishment of American homes. This was followed by the establishment of a magazine to sort of inform and publish the uh, By the formation of the school, when it became recognized that uh, really training was needed, that uh, uh, otherwise it would uh, just uh, collect uh, presently uh, known skills but lead to no particular advances. And then it was recognized too that a lot of these people were deficient in technical information, particularly in the area of design and marketing sense and so forth. So the magazine Craft Horizons. Craft Horizons. And it first was published, I think, as a linear graph journal of knowledge. It was a remarkable publication, very beautiful, very attractive. Well, the final uh, link of the chain became the Museum of Contemporary Crafts. New York, which is on 53rd Street and near the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, it had been my hope uh, that the museum would have been located in, in Rochester and uh, have become a part of uh, the uh, general development of a craft program that would uh, have greater strength as a result of consolidation. Uh, <coughs> Uh, parenthetically, I'm going to say here that uh, one of the disappointments to me personally about uh, the way in which the movement developed was the inability of these various units to work uh, cooperatively and cohesively. Uh, my 
tried on several occasions to uh, uh, interest the ones in charge of those other activities uh, to meet and then consider how we might uh, work together without uh, any, uh, any luck, any results. And uh, the reasons uh, for this, I think, uh, lie in the, the uh, ambitions, if I may put it, of uh, uh, some of the people in charge of these uh, other farms and the career uh, venture. And uh, <clears throat> this is where I think possess a great deal of force uh, in uh, seeing how these things uh, grow. She kept uh, reasonable control of uh, all the facets of the enterprise uh, <clears throat> as uh, individual units. As you know, she was uh, devoted her interest uh, to the school and became a member of the Board of Trustees and Trustees. And, uh, and uh, <clears throat> she became uh, uh, ardent in uh, doing the very best possible for each of these uh, programs. She subsidized them. She gave them part of her energy. She gave them her ideas. Gave her interest and her encouragement. Uh, I, I might say that she's one of the most remarkable, and uh, this is a word that she has done in describing people. She's one of the most beautiful people I've ever known. Plain, intelligent, hardworking, conscientious, imaginative, <clears throat> and uh, she was good to us, and she was uh, she was good uh, to us. I think she's made a tremendous impression on all of us in contact with her. Well, she uh, chartered through the state of New York the uh, edu uh, American Craftsman's Education Council in 1943. The School for American Craftsmen was set up at Dartmouth in 1946. I wasn't with them at the time. I joined the school at Albert. Uh, there we had uh, the small uh, faculty of five. Uh, And uh, eight, <coughs> eight, <coughs> uh, one in Texas, two each in uh, wood, metal, and ceramics, plus one in charge of design education, uh, Fred Meyer, who uh, is currently a member of the faculty of the School of Art Design. Uh, <coughs> I well remember some of those men, Harold. They were really outstanding. Uh, was Ernest Brace? Uh, Ernest uh, Brace uh, and, and Tate Fred and Wood. And, Wood. and Wood. And Olin Russen, who came with us, is now teaching the Gotcha College. Uh, Olin Russen and uh, Lynn uh, Field, uh, who uh, remained in Alfred. Uh, decided not to come to Rochester. Jack Cripp uh, in, uh, in Larry Copeland in uh, Methel. And uh, Carl Laurel in Texas. And uh, uh, the, the aforementioned uh, uh, Fred Meyer in Top Design. Well, uh, we were really, I think, a little isolated. And then, uh, too, there was some discomfort felt by the segment of the opportunity uh, as a result of our presence there. The, school, the College of Ceramics felt that, in a sense, we were usurping some of the territory that was rightfully theirs in the ceramic area. And uh, uh, it just so happened. <coughs> that in the uh, ceramic shows in Syracuse, the, the students and faculty in the school began to win awards <coughs> and recognition and re in Syracuse uh, uh, ceramic national. <coughs> and there was uh, some uh, feeling that uh, perhaps uh, uh, we were benefiting by the prestige of the College of Ceramics. 
Actually, we were not, I think. If anything, we were advancing the prestige of the college. But it was apparent that uh, we weren't totally, uh, totally acceptable uh, in the operant uh, community. And in addition, <coughs> Mrs. Webb uh, felt that it would be in the long-term best interest of the school if it related to a stronger and more vigorous institution located in a larger center where the students had more access to uh, uh, cultural affairs and so on and so on. <clears throat> so, after uh, three years at Alfred, and uh, our students took a highly technical program there, I think they took but uh, one course in the, uh, in the university, and uh, <clears throat> they were given a diploma, which uh, also I think some of the faculty at uh, Alfred University disliked the notion that the degree granting institution uh, was converting uh, to a sense, in a sense, by offering a two year uh, diploma. <coughs> so, <coughs> as a consequence of the meeting and uh, uh, Mark and Mrs. Webb, <coughs> your visit with Mark to the uh, school in Alfred to look us over. Uh, the school joint institute, we began to remodel the so-called Reynolds building. I remember that. 150 Spring, Spring Street. The great first two floors. Right. The, the tower. The tower. <laughs> the tower. But it had been a great uh, family home built in 1856. Quite, a, quite an architectural landmark. We regretted it. It's now, of course, uh, destroyed. Make way for the new expressway. But uh, this building was remodeled during the course of the winter and spring of 49-50. And we opened our summer session there in late June of 1950. And from then on, we were underway. And from that point uh, on, <coughs> Mrs. Webb uh, became interested not only in the school, but in the institute. And uh, we uh, began to have opportunities for uh, uh, participation, academic participation that we hadn't had in Alfred where we were, you know, uh, poor cousins, physically removed, uh, educationally and spiritually removed from uh, rather significant ways from the life of the university. And here, as I've indicated, we were, we were accepted. Well, I know that Harold, you immediately became a member of the Dean's Committee and of the Policy Committee, and uh, you spoke very well for the press. I know that all of our people really welcomed you and your faculty and the students. We had been perhaps a bit apprehensive at first, but it was not long before we realized that this new school was uh, making an outstanding contribution to the Institute. And as I remember it, uh, the American craftsmen probably received more publicity from the local ladies nationally than any of the other departments of college. Well, uh, part of that, I like to think of Leo was a result of uh, uh, the quality of our programs. <laughs> but uh, actually, <coughs> we hustled. We, uh, we hustled it, and uh, part of uh, that kind of recognition. Uh, comes about only as a result of, of, of a conscious effort to get it. It ought to be this way. I mean, there were lots of people at the Institute who did remarkable jobs and worked for your students. But uh, <clears throat> we, we uh, were uh, in the position uh, of having to win some recognition. I mean, we were young, you know, uh, after all. Uh, under a decade, Existence. And uh, so it was uh, imperative for us to uh, establish an image and uh, acquaint the community and our the people in the incident uh, of our activities. That was one of the reasons that we devoted an area in the uh, Reynolds family and the School of American Craftsmen uh, to an exhibition center uh, that uh, attracted. Uh, unusual numbers of uh, people <coughs> to the school. 
and we had a chance then to show them what was being done and to uh, win their esteem. Uh, we were aided in this uh, by Mark. And Find the fight art school for American Patent brought together first, I believe, division, and then the college. You were made dean of college and also retained the other position for the American Patent. Is that correct? Yes. <coughs> I uh, received I, just one salary. I remember, I remember the one salary particular, although I wore the two hands. But uh, Leo, <coughs> Uh, when I uh, uh, when I came to the institute, I found uh, 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 what I thought to be a rather uh, remarkable atmosphere. <clears throat> I had uh, been in a number of institutions, taught in several, and I think that I can fairly say that the institute was the first one in which I felt the absence of rivalries. Uh, there was no academic politicking or law growing. And uh, <clears throat> that was one of the strengths. I have never really fully understood how we managed to avoid that. But uh, I, I have some suspicions. Uh, I, I think Mark's own example, <clears throat> personality. personality and example, had a great deal to do with that. Uh, also, the firmness of his leadership. And uh, the sense, strong sense of direction that he was uh, able to, to give. But uh, uh, what it finally came down to <clears throat> was just a, a great deal of personal and interest and cooperation by people in other institutions who might have been seen as my rivals. Now, <clears throat> in certain other schools, which I prefer not to think of, but which I have been. There was a general feeling in the faculty uh, and among the administrative leaderships that only that one area can grow only at the expense of another in some fashion. Uh, this would have to do with budgets or space or enrollment, the attraction of students from older programs to newer programs or something like that. And so there was always a, a, a feeling uh, of competition within those institutions, <clears throat> which I never, <clears throat> that is, for, for budget for students and so on. <clears throat> and this led to, shall I say, certain and various practices on occasion by the people uh, who should have had more sense and, and more taste. But uh, I, I just never sensed this uh, at the institute. We were remarkably free of it, I when you could drag them into the Mark Ellington's personality and strong leadership. Like we were small in the earlier years, both my industry at RIT and your industry at RIT. And uh, likewise, we have a very unique uh, department. It's not very unique, it's very bigger. Well, <coughs> but, but they, know, they, they could have been. Uh, now, for example, uh, <coughs> uh, in, 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 in constructive ways, it did compete. I, uh, as a matter of fact, encouraged among the faculty of the School of Art Design and the School of American Press for a certain sense of competition. And uh, not to, to the point, however, where destructive tensions were produced, but the, the knowledge that uh, we were trying each to do our best uh, led uh, to a certain stimulation uh, on the part of all to do their collective business. And, uh, <clears throat> but I remember vividly Mark's reception of me personally and yours, Fred Coles, and uh, at the time Earl Morcock, who was in general charge of uh, the remodeling and refurbishing, as it used to be called, uh, areas of the institute. But the <clears throat> Carol and Lad, uh, the the the, 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 the those uh, people at Clifford Elk, 
Now those people with whom we had a slight reptile or as a consequence of our existing, that went out, as you know, we had a program of home decoration in uh, her business administration program. And uh, <coughs> Carol Neblet, after all, uh, is an artistic but green side of the company. Clifford L. I couldn't have, <coughs> I, I couldn't have <coughs> had a higher regard, really, for a gentleman of the old school than I had for Clifford L. He certainly was. He really was a wonderful person. And uh, uh, as this is really no criticism uh, uh, of it is intended to be. But uh, <coughs> the, the, the school, I felt, uh, uh, the School of Art and Design, benefited uh, by our coming to join them. Because I, I think that uh, uh, our people <coughs> were able to present some new views and receive some. And then we used uh, the exhibition gallery, there, which Clifford was very generous. And uh, we, uh, <clears throat> we found uh, uh, mutual respect. I, I and I remember uh, uh, Clifford's pictures. You know, he's a highly dedicated well, religious kind of person. And uh, I don't really know about the uh, aphorisms. Proverbs and so forth, he would have written on the boards and each morning. Remember that one day? That was a practice. Right. Well, uh, he, uh, he, he was just a, a remarkable man, a talented example <clears throat> as a painter, although of course his style was not contemporary. But uh, uh, he, he was a very gentle, very friendly, very uh, kindly. I, I remember him uh, particularly, uh, along with uh, Mark and with Carol and Earl and the band and the rest of those people. As a matter of fact, the, <coughs> I think one of the satisfactions that some of us are uh, yeah, is that of having worked <coughs> for a very considerable span of years with people from the perspective of my I think that was <coughs> one of the great strengths of the institute, and I hope it remains a strength of the institute. I'm not sure that it will, but uh, <coughs> I, I certainly, uh, certainly hope it does. Carol, uh, you mentioned some of the outstanding faculty, uh, and I don't know whether we skipped anyone, we should. But there have also been some students and graduates who have gone on who made outstanding reputations. Do uh, you remember some of those, just offhand? Well, uh, some of them. Uh, well, I, I think our, our great influence <coughs> is really yet to be found. And this is going to come about as a consequence of uh, the really extraordinary number of people that we have teaching in institutions of higher learning everywhere in the United States. So our influence in this sense is considerable indeed. <coughs> uh, we, we've uh, Established an influence uh, not only in it through uh, our uh, graduates who are in the field of uh, education, but in uh, the example of those who have uh, shops or they're carrying on the uh, productive activities of their own as individuals or as the operators of small producing units. Uh, I, I think that uh, I might cite a person such as Ron Pearson. So, uh, well, he's many, many what the uh, rating as among the top, certainly in the country. And uh, uh, he's uh, extremely uh, productive, extremely creative, continues to develop and, and change. I think that Bruce Ebring, uh, not many people here, I'm not even good as uh, assistant director of design for the forum for the Silverstone. Is a, a, an excellent job. He's designed all the contemporary stuff that the uh, forum produces. Uh, <coughs> well, the, the, uh, the Jim Bailey, who's a manager of hardware, is one of our graduates who are working with furniture design. 
you know, hard work in the house. Uh, it was doing quite a job in this community. Then uh, it was bought out, I guess, by the Rochester Stationery, and now they have quite an establishment. I guess they're doing around a year, around three quarter million a year. And they've developed a, a line of modular furniture. We've used it at the Institute and other campus. And uh, so Bailey, I think, is an outstanding person. I think that uh, uh, Colin Richmond, who's the director of design with Toll, the uh, software company in Maryport, Massachusetts, is an uh, extraordinary uh, 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 I think that uh, <coughs> Educational world and uh, not at uh, Syracuse, for example. Henry Gregor, Professor Scranton, uh, Mike Jerry, who's an uh, associate professor of crafts and uh, jewelry. Uh, Sheridan College of Design is uh, large, but the staff, by the staff, staff by graduates in the School of American Craftsmen is going to have a very, very considerable uh, influence uh, in, uh, in Canada. Dan Valenza, the University of uh, New Hampshire. Uh, Roy Carver, University of Cincinnati. Uh, Max Nixon, University of uh, Oregon. Leonard Price, University of Illinois. Uh, oh, I, I can listen to, I remember uh, this side lawyer, Ronald uh, Sinon, he, uh, he taught for a long while at the University of Alaska at Nome. Uh, actually, it's a place called College. Uh, but uh, now he's in charge of a special project uh, that has to do with the uh, education of the uh, Alaskan Indians or Eskimos. And uh, in, in short, uh, Leo, whenever you pick up uh, Grand Horizons, you find some collections. Very often, you find uh, in newspapers and magazines and stories of uh, uh, exhibitions of the crafts, references to this, to its influence. Tosa Radakovich uh, is living in Benzino, California. Ruth Radakovich, Ruth Clark Radakovich are both former students. Uh, are uh, doing some of the very creative work in, in the field of jewelry and films. So, uh, but I, I can cite the, oh, the, the large number of, of uh, the names of our graduates and I think Franz will indeed. Jack Grip, Dave Grid, uh, <coughs> Carl Laurel, uh, well, the present people, I think, are extremely, extremely deep. Some of the second generation. Hans Christensen. Hans Christensen. I, I think, in many respects, I think Hans Christensen is really the best of the business with his background. And George Jensen and Copenhagen, he's been here, you know, since then. And uh, is uh, able, well, I think from the standpoint of teaching ability and just quiet daily contribution uh, to the program. Uh, I should mention that before we go. Well, uh, we have conducted several evaluations. And uh, when you find a person like Colbert who consistently scores 4.9 on the scale of 5, and I might say that students in the School of American Crafts have been a highly critical bunch. You know, they're, uh, they're not a subservient uh, group, of, of, individual. group of, of individuals. But also, they, oh, I don't know whether you recall the uh, survey made at the time of the Middle States visit of alumni or the revisit that we in the second book, uh, <coughs> where the graduates were asked, would they, what did they think of the program? Would they have returned? When you find uh, nine out of 10 graduates saying uh, they felt that the program was excellent, they would have done the same thing over again. I think that's remarkable testimony as to the fact that well, you've had to find the figure that among the group of our students. Harold, large measure, this was your leader. Oh, you're, you're kind. I don't believe it. Fred Meyer, I don't know if you mentioned Well, Fred, Fred uh, you know, had a, had a good, 
uh, and uh, uh, he, uh, he he's quiet, but uh, he shows consistently that uh, John Ray's been hard one of the best, and uh, he, he's a remarkable teacher, and a very broad gauge fellow. He's a playwright, yes, uh, yes, a filmmaker. Well, uh, Leo, you didn't ask me some of the questions I wanted to talk about. All right, well, why don't you just uh, respond to some of the questions I haven't asked you? Well, uh, <clears throat> I, I uh, noted here one of were some of the key figures. Well, I mentioned uh, Mark. I'm not going to mention Leo. But I have a great deal of respect uh, for you and for what you did. On occasion, <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> I, I think I ought to say something special about uh, Ralph Tyler's <clears throat> uh, in the Institute, but also in the, the condition he went on out. <clears throat> and, and I felt I received a kind of education from him, and I deeply enjoyed all of those meetings and his extremely fertile and perceptive. And then, <laughs> too, I think that uh, uh, he uh, did as much as anyone uh, to indicate to me the necessity for the uh, art <clears throat> And uh, the need uh, for really uh, careful plan and evaluation <clears throat> of, of what was that you really uh, weren't quite sure of what you were doing unless you're trying to find out. And uh, uh, I, uh, I hadn't uh, been as uh, assiduous in pursuing this part of the job as finding out what we were doing by looking to see what we did. Uh, as I was after meeting Ralph and uh, after having a number of discussions with him. Well, certainly uh, Ralph had a good lady contribution to American higher education to all of our and particularly to our IT I think that his techniques were something that we clearly defined their objective, outlined the steps they're going to take to the achievement and finally to evaluate how well they were moving toward the contribution of our community. What well, was a distinct contribution to Leo, and I, I just, uh, I, I hate to think that Ralph is growing older, you know, and, and uh, that kind of influence is going to be, going to be lost. I, I think it will be, because Ralph, in a sense, was you know, I, I, I never met anyone like him previously, and I, I haven't met anyone quite like him since. He's been here a couple of uh, I persuaded him to go and uh, meet with the members of the Western Board of Education and some of the Western Board for 13 years. And he was a, a, a generous and friendly man, although he must have looked on us on occasion as him and kind of uh, influence. Uh, in terms of his own stature, his, his own remarkable mind, encyclopedic in the word, to discover that you describe Ralph's mind. <coughs> He must have felt that he was kneeling, you know, sort of people who the best and finally partial understand. But I tell you, he was patient, he was helpful, he was encouraging, he was humorous. Uh, the most serious discussions were of what they were always enlivened by a, a bit of humor, a little jocular treatment of the subject before he got down to the meat of it. <laughs> but you know, I used to enjoy watching his mind work. When a question was asked, or he was asked to comment on something, you could, the first two or three seconds, you could see him sort of turning the page here, you know, and then it would come out without anything, you know, in the most remarkable, ordered fashion, an introduction, a body of content, a summary, and a conclusion. <laughs> and, and you know what? Watching him train me to 
really begin to think and uh, uh, speak in an expository way, uh, in a fashion, I think, a bit better as a consequence of my context. Lecture, he made a great impression from Mark, from Jim Wilson, remember? Well, you were very fortunate. You were very fortunate. Well, uh, then, then I remember, I remember Jim Gleason, of course, that remarkable old gentleman, George Clark, when I first came here, his daily appearances. Fred Cole, uh, I, I liked Fred very much, who would, was a hard man to get a nickel from. And, uh, but uh, he was a very friendly and uh, a generous guy at heart. He didn't have to give you any money. <laughs> but he also, also used to give me a lot of excellent internal advice. Uh, you know, save well, uh, I think that uh, you have a number of experiences in the for some major issues. <coughs> well, I think they all. Uh, the major issues had to do with the positioning of the school, uh, its uh, growth, because it was destined for the cars of this country. In one fashion, you know, when I came to the Institute in 1950, it was a two-year degree granting, or a non-degree granting institution, I think it's certainly one of the most remarkable things in higher education would be <coughs> over a period of 15 to 20 years of uh, <coughs> the uh, movement of the Institute through the associate into the back of our, into the graduate field, from no interest in accreditation to full accreditation by uh, not only the regional associations, but uh, by the various accredited <laughs> units of professional accreditation. Uh, <laughs> the movement uh, from uh, 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 the distance from some of the pertinences of the, uh, <clears throat> higher education to acceptance, but, but not completely to the point where it became acceptance of more of the meaning. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, growth of endowment, the growth of physical plan, the improvement of the programs, <clears throat> Improvement of the faculty, the stature, the quality, the competence, all of these things. And they were uh, the uh, Mark Summers. And uh, I, I remember those lists that you used to keep uh, in order to review the center who was doing what on the faculty, who was uh, winning uh, more advanced degrees, or, or in our case, uh, what were our faculty doing to increase in professional stature through professional performance, exhibit exhibits, and all the rest of that. So <clears throat> I think that uh, uh, your perception of the importance of this, I think because you were really more interested in this than Mark was, I think Mark was, you know, interested, but he had to be interested in other things, raising, raising money and so forth. And this was, in a sense, uh, your opinion. One of the, one of my questions was a girl, or faculty developed. Also, I guess one of the disappointments uh, was seeing some of the faculty that uh, were not willing. Well, I, I, don't think much, I don't think you had to see it. In some of our areas, I think it's a good thing. That was true. It's not about the one who was willing to do it. It's not about the one who was willing to do it. It's not about the one who was willing to do it. The process is not the one. Well, I, I, I uh, fortunately uh, had no sight of them because uh, the people with whom uh, I worked uh, were delighted to be a part of this emerging institution. They felt uh, my great disappointment to Leo was uh, that the community really uh, never appreciated the full stature. It was a much better institution uh, than uh, I think 
run uh, Rochester wrecking. So I think that may be less true now than it was back in the days when I joined the Institute. But uh, uh, I remember you and I attending a meeting at the university, which we sat in the house, Brian O'Brien, whatever his name is, and he was asked by uh, <coughs> a visitor from the Lawrenceville School uh, about the Rochester Institute of Technology. And this Lawrenceville visitor didn't know that we'd be sitting across the table were from the Institute. And Brian O'Brien said it is a training school, vocational school. Over on the other side of the river, I never forgot that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I became, I was determined that in the area, in the community in which I could affect the life of the university, they were going to know they had some competition. They were going to know that we weren't a training they were going to know that in our field of creating confidence, that we were going to show it. And we damn well did. That's right. Does it have, we damn well did. Because <clears throat> not many people have heard of the Department of Fine Arts and the University of Rochester. But a lot of, you know, a lot of people in the community have heard about the College of Fine and Applied Arts and the Rochester Institute of Technology. Well, I remember Eric Walker, former president of Penn State, <coughs> The reputation of this institution lags behind the institution. About seven years on the way up, about seven years on the way down to today. So that, uh, we weren't very well known in the city, we weren't very heavily regarded in the earlier years. But, uh, I think that's right. Well, uh, Leo, I, I find that when I, in retrospect, you, you and I were lucky guys. We, we, uh, we were at the Institute during the years of change, and we had something to do uh, from this movement, from the diploma and uh, a small building and converted garages for libraries and so forth to a fine plan, uh, excellent uh, programs, but to the point now where we have, I think, the physical things and uh, the educational things to really grow. Uh, I think that uh, the new president, uh, Paul Miller, and the new faculty, administrative officers and faculty, have, have kind of a tremendous responsibility. Uh, some of us, uh, you know, like uh, the coral and the forms, you know, to provide the base for the living coral that. Uh, We've done something now to provide the things for a program that should be extraordinary in the future. Well, the Institute just changed the track of this degree, and uh, they think that uh, Dr. Miller realized all this and is uh, looking to the current uh, urban university on the well, I, I, uh, I think the Institute has been fortunate in its leadership. <coughs> Mark, of course, I agree and know very well with me. I knew <coughs> President Miller less well. I had limited up to him. We didn't meet him. But uh, everything that he said and did, or nearly everything, uh, I thought right off the bat. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> As a matter of fact, it's astonishing to me that the Institute, these two remarkable men, has been in a position to, to hold them. And, uh, because I'm, I'm sure Mark had me on this. I'm sure President Miller uh, probably has had all of them already. And, uh, so I, I, I think we've been fortunate in our leadership. You gave a chance here. What were the greatest disappointments? Like? Uh, 
sure about my disappointments too. They, well, I think we're about to the end of this tape there also. Uh, either we better stop the machine or the disappointment would better be very short. Uh, Why don't we... Uh, I, I think my disappointment was that we didn't uh, fully utilize uh, through the opportunities for our interdisciplinary programs. This was due to that parochialism and unwillingness on the part of some. Well, Harold, you were uh, talking a little bit about some of the disappointments, some of your greatest disappointments, by the word RIT. Well, the preceding that, number seven, Leo, uh, is the, uh, what were the greatest satisfactions. Now, I've, I've uh, talked about those in uh, some ways, but uh, <clears throat> what I think I'm going to do is just go quickly through some notes I have made, and then if there's anything that you find of particular interest, why and invite me to elaborate. I'm very good at uh, verbal elaboration, so I, I'd be delighted to cooperate. All right. Well, fine. Well, number seven, what were the greatest satisfactions that you had or that kept you at RIT? Well, there was this spirit of cooperation that I've mentioned, which I found singular. Uh, secondly, the desire to improve, which uh, improved the programs, the quality of the people, the service to the community. Uh, I felt these. Uh, <clears throat> I felt that there was a desire uh, constantly uh, uh, expressed to strengthen the institution academically, to improve the physical plan. I remember the efforts we made on uh, Plymouth Avenue South. You recall, Neil, how we redid the School for American Craftsmen as a project. We redid the auditorium, so-called E-125, yeah. to make it more presentable and so forth. Well, there was this, this uh, desire to, to, you know, to make the place better. And uh, also there was a, a continuing uh, uh, concern e expressed uh, as to the relevance of the program in, so in social terms. Now, uh, I, I like to think that the Institute was really well in advance of its time in talking, using this word relevance and, and uh, understanding its meaning. Uh, <coughs> and also, the, 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 the Institute's uh, uh, emphasis upon uh, constant examination of the society to find out what kinds of things ought to be available in education. All, all of these things, I think, were uh, part of my satisfactions, seeing uh, that uh, they existed at the Institute and that I could uh, be a part of it. Then there was constant encouragement given to us who were in the front lines, so to speak, in the uh, educational process, and actually dealing with the students and working in, in the programs in our, in our given areas. There's a lot of encouragement uh, given to us. And then I felt in the College of Fine and the Fine Arts, the Institute family took genuine pride in our accomplishments. And uh, this is encouraging, you know, and the people with which we work are willing to pat you on the back and say, gee, we are doing fine, this is good for us, it's good for the community, uh, go ahead. On my disappointments. Uh, there was a, uh, you recognize this, I think you mentioned that uh, a kind of parochial uh, quality uh, there. Uh, <clears throat> no great uh, awareness of what we could do, not only well as independent areas, but what we could do as a consequence of uh, the establishment of an interdependence. We, we never really fully explored this, Leo, as we should. Now, granted, we were very busy. We had a lot of other things on our minds because we couldn't have done everything that we did in less than 20 years, you know, if we had perhaps given everything a final finish and polish. But that was an area of neglect, and I regret that we didn't uh, do more. I think that's true. We should have had more interdisciplinary uh, programs because certainly some of our areas could have uh, strengthened each other and come out with a far better interdiscipl interdisciplinary program than either one operating individually. The students have brought this about in a large measure, though, Harold, because of the, the tremendous pressure from students uh, within the past few years, and actually the uh, depression that has hit higher education has brought, uh, because of necessity, some of the departments closer together and uh, willing to take a look at that. That I recognize, but we, we should have been smarter than the students. 
Well, well yes, we should have seen this. <coughs> well, some of us did. You know, but there was a question <coughs> of where you spent your time after we actually began the, uh, the construction of the new campus. Very few of us had time for anything. <coughs> but uh, I'll tell you, uh, we, we still must recognize this as one of our deficiencies. I recognize it as one of mine. But I should have pushed a little harder for this. Another thing that I regret was that uh, we, we never recognized fully the degree to which an institution is not a group of programs alone, but it's an environment and an atmosphere. And I, I think that probably we were so concerned, so committed, uh, that, that we didn't take the time or allocate resources to the establishment of that cultural climate, that intellectual I think that you did more there, Harold, uh, probably than any other single person at the Institute. You were constantly bringing this to the attention of the deans and the department head. And I think that you and your people, but particularly you, because of your emphasis on this, really made a great contribution, more than well, you know. I, well, I, I like to think so, but I, I had some help in there and, and some sentiment. Uh, <clears throat> Bob Cope, who's yeah. now our uh, dean of uh, the University School, University School, 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 University of right. <coughs> Bob and I used to meet frequently on this. You remember those programs on the Baroque and the Renaissance and the foundations of modern culture yeah. and so forth that we gave on a shoestring, <coughs> you know, budgets of $500 and so forth. <laughs> we should have done more of that sort of thing. <coughs> uh, <coughs> I'm proud of the fact that when we, jumped, when we got into the summer programs, we jumped into it in both feet. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, I think the College of Fine Applied Arts was the first really to have, honest to God, summer program, going summer programs. And the first to really make it possible for people to come there and complete a program. And uh, uh, this was always part of my feeling that we ought to use that institution that night once in the year, for the year around. We ought to use it uh, more cooperatively and fully. But uh, <clears throat> I, I think this uh, this lack of cultural climate, Leo, was one of the things that we should have done and it would have had some effect on, on our graduates. I felt also that we might have been remiss in not uh, giving fuller consideration as to what we could do during the course of the undergraduate years to make students into committed to learning. Yes, we have never been entirely successful. And uh, uh, if I were doing it over again, I would have given that more thought. And even if it meant robbing certain other areas of my responsibilities for the time to, to do that. But, uh, <coughs> I, I think that I'd like to pay Ralph Van Pearson a kind of a compliment here. I think, as I looked around me at the other schools, that uh, Edwina and Van probably did more uh, to conduct colloquia uh, symposiums, uh, to bring in people, uh, you know. Uh, now, they, they were fortunate in that uh, that went with her contacts in the business community and Van and his contacts with the scientific community could get people from Rochester Business and Eastman Kodak and Xerox and so forth. They were glad to come in and meet with some senior students, you know, and faculty in the discussion. And uh, <clears throat> but I think Van and went a, yes, did, they did. They did a did a good job there. As a matter of fact, I uh, I sort of uh, and. Uh, <clears throat> I'll tell you another thing, Leo, that uh, bothered me uh, during my years at the Institute. I, some, I felt that sometimes we were carried away uh, by uh, the uh, desire, our desire to state our goals and purposes and plan for those with the record, without giving quite the recognition we should that people should have carried, that had to carry those out. In other words, I, I sort of believe that <coughs> a, a, 
a good school is really a, a group of good people. If you get the good people, somehow I can get most of the other other things. But uh, I, I think that uh, we could have possibly invested more in faculty. Uh, although this, this I don't, uh, perhaps I shouldn't state so dogmatically, because I didn't have the full picture of the institute or the full view of what Mark schools and the board schools were for the institute. But you have just so much money and how you choose to spend it. You know. Matter of you judgment. Know, matter of judgment. <laughs> but the way I tried to operate first the School of American Craftsmen and then the College of Fine Applied Arts after I became the dean of the college was to get the best people I could find. And I spent a lot of time reading the journals and watching the exhibitions to find the new talent where the new talent was shown. And uh, I had to do this uh, by looking at the younger talent because I couldn't afford some of the established talent. And uh, <clears throat> we, we were lucky in bringing to the Institute a lot of younger people who were extraordinary. And we, some of them we've lost. I mean, Al Paley, you know, uh, the state institutions uh, in New York and elsewhere have been able to, to outbid us for some of these uh, people. But uh, if I had a chance to change anything, well, <clears throat> really, I don't think fundamentally there's an awful lot that I would have wished to change. Because I think. The, the, the judgment as to whether we did right or wrong is finally borne out by a judgment that could be based on what we achieved at the end of, say, 20 years by 1970. And that was as remarkable. Well, the growth of the institution in academic uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, quality and posture first, uh, <coughs> we were just an awful lot better. By all the formal measures, we were just an awful lot better. We had <coughs> an awful lot better physical plan, which of course is the housing. Really, it isn't the program, it's just the shelter for the programs. But uh, I, I think the, we, we, must have, we must have done something right. <laughs> we must have done something, uh, something right. Uh, the programs, uh, the plan, the endowment, uh, well, what were the Institute's greatest strengths? I think the awareness of the, uh, the need to prepare students for a real world and for real problems. This, I think, is the key thing. Uh, and secondly, uh, the family feeling that Mark built so skillful. <clears throat> uh, I mentioned this uh, lack of cultivation of the students to become art and alumni. And uh, our inability in certain areas to remove that parochial, we are doing it well enough, let's just stay this way. Harold, I'm uh, very much interested in this next question here. What of the educational, economic, and sociological impact that you feel the Institute has made upon the Rochester and the Western New York community? Uh, tremendous, in my uh, judgment, uh, Theo. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> not as recognized as it, uh, as it should be. Uh, I think that uh, the Institute was, uh, for many years, largely conditioned by lo local needs. For this, of course, we received a lot of local support. <clears throat> uh, and uh, our, our people flowed into jobs where they weren't conspicuous because often they weren't leadership jobs. For secondary level uh, jobs, you know. so the, the the influence wasn't spectacular, but I, I think extremely extremely significant. Now, <coughs> uh, I have felt uh, I lamented really the incident, uh, the community that more fully recognized the institution. Maybe this is the way people always feel about institutions they've served. You know, that was better than most people recognize it to be. But in my own area, the College of Fine Applied Arts, I'm speaking now of the School of Art Design as well as the School of American Craftsmen, I think we've had an extraordinary impact. Simply fantastic in the last 20 years. As a matter of fact, this was a conservative community with this gallery notion of art that you went and looked at 
you know, you, you really didn't feel it, or you didn't buy it, or you didn't consume it. We, we sort of changed them. And, and uh, <clears throat> there's a dynamic interest, certainly, in the hand crafts and in our in Rochester. You over a craft shop uh, on almost any street in Rochester. Well, uh, it's, uh, I think, uh, <clears throat> We, we couldn't have done it without the institute. I mean, we, it was a co we, really we were uh, part of a collective effort. Now, <clears throat> the point I was trying to make on several occasions here is that it could have been a more collective uh, uh, effort. I think we should have influenced the other schools, the departments of the institute more, and they should have influenced us more. They would have done this if we had more of these interdisciplinary programs. But as you know, Leo, one of the things that Mark saw to it that we all did is work on it. During the years that I was at the Institute, I was regularly in my office on Saturdays. I couldn't have done the job. And uh, I don't see how we all lived through the period between 1964 and 1970. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, because at least uh, no one was hired to help me. Planning for the new campus. Planning the new campus. Program. Uh, developing program. programs. Uh, uh, and, and, and you can't you know, do buildings without thinking of things that go on in them. As a matter of fact, what went on in them was uh, our primary concern. Uh, I, I think uh, that uh, our impact, uh, Leo, was uh, tremendous. And uh, I, I hope that it, uh, sometime, at some time that the community more fully recognizes what we have done. Uh, to to uh, contribute to the life of uh, this community. Uh, we're turning out some good people in the institute. I think Gene Dupre, who's not in the institute, uh, you know, I, I think guys like Gene are remarkable. Uh, <clears throat> well, this leads into this uh, other question, which is the other side of the coin. What way do you feel the Rochester community influence, altered, or warped the institute's program? Well, I, I've already spoken in one fashion or another about uh, the College of Fine and Applied Arts and the School of American Craftsmen, the School of Art and Design. Uh, I think we profoundly influenced the uh, community. The shops, the galleries, the museums, public taste, public interest, publicity, by any measure you want to choose, this is, uh, this is obvious. But I think the Institute has done the same thing. Uh, you know, uh, an active citizen and an active uh, alumnus, uh, such as uh, Harris uh, uh, Rudensky, for example. Bud Rudensky. Bud Rudensky. We ought to have more people like Bud. You know, and Charlie, uh, what's his name, the uh, Kodak uh, Bishop. Uh, I think we're beginning now to do this. But uh, I, I think that uh, our people have gone into the, the Rochester community, into the retail stores, into the industries, into the businesses, and uh, <clears throat> they've become the buyers and they've become, uh, you know, the uh, supervisors uh, here and the there, the engineers and so forth, but they, they haven't uh, uh, emerged quite as they should. As a matter of fact, in the early years of the Institute, I think, produced more of those outstanding people, possibly. I mean, uh, I remember the board, the Rice, or Reese, was it? Ed Reese. Ed Reese. And then the RG&E fellow, when I came here, the president, I think, was an Institute, former Institute. Uh, no, Phoebe was, uh, but there had been some. Great. Uh, Ray Olson. Taylor Institute. He's a fellow, I think. I mean, the, or the Institute early in its history had produced uh, some of those. Do you think that the uh, Rochester community, being what it was, primarily a scientific, conservative community, has unduly influenced the Institute's program? Well, I think the key word there is unduly. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think so. <clears throat> I've heard that said. Uh, I've heard that said. <clears throat> But I, I'll tell you, I don't think how the uh, I, I don't see how the institute could have grown and developed as it did without developing uh, full awareness of what the community's needs were and moving to satisfy those. Maybe, well, maybe we moved to satisfy them extravagantly. I don't know. 
But again, uh, you, you could uh, discuss this and dispute it and verbalize and so forth. But the fact finally emerges that in 1950 we're here, and in 1970 we're here, and in 1970 where there's no way that you can compare this institution with what existed in 1950. And in the 20, I, I would venture to say that I know of no institution, in my experience, and I've read, looked, and seen a lot, I suppose, that have developed in uh, as uh, spectacular a fashion as has the Institute. Uh, the way we moved into graduate study, for example, uh, we, <coughs> Leo, <coughs> we were offering <coughs> uh, <coughs> graduate programs. Uh, as I recall, as early as 1958, we admitted That's our correct. first. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> this is eight years after we came to the institution as a diploma institution. In eight years, we're offering graduate study and damn good graduate study, too. As a matter of fact, Leo, I don't know whether you know this or not, but <clears throat> We have the largest graduate program in the, in the fine, fine arts in the state of New York. And our people go into more things. Uh, <clears throat> this program that we developed, uh, the Master of Science in Teaching, you know, where the yeah. person in the, uh, the baccalaureate in the fine arts could take a fifth year and prepare for teaching in the secondary school. This is fantastic. A lot of your people have gone out of <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Harvard provided our model for that, of course, but uh, that is a conversion of uh, liberal arts people with, with specialized or uh, liberal art professional training to, to teaching. But I, I think uh, we did a, a fantastic job. Of course, moving from the diploma uh, program, the diploma programs, to first the associate, the baccalaureate, and the uh, graduate level, master's level, required some education of the New York State Education Department as well as. Uh, oh, that I know. Our own people. That I know. Because they were not quite sure that the sorts of programs we were offering were really respectable. This was an uphill uh, battle also. I've often wondered what uh, Joe Nikos thinks about some of those early conversations in view of the direction that higher education is taking now, and that he's espousing. He's espousing now. He's espousing, by the way. I and remember. He used, to, uh, he used to curse and rant and stamp his feet. Yes, I remember. Uh, one or two uh, meetings in his office, and Dr. Ellington was president, president and president, and uh, they used to call a spade a spade. Well, they did. Both strong characters. It's quite profane. <coughs> well, how would you have rated the Institute as a place in which to study? Oh, I couldn't say other than warm and friendly. Of course, it didn't pay me enough. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think, strictly speaking, that they paid anybody. No, our you know, I mean, it wasn't a question of uh, personally depriving me personally, you know, but I, you know, I think that uh, this is being changed as far as it came. Well, this uh, last question here, how you would have rated the quality of the educational programs uh, while you were here. Uh, Seems to me we've talked quite a bit about yeah, that. Yes. They have changed market. markedly and for the better. And I, I, I think that, uh, as I said, the, uh, the <coughs> final measure is what you can see in terms of uh, existing programs and facilities. And they're so far removed from what you and I knew in 1950 that uh, it can only indicate, as I said before, that whatever we did, it must have been right to some degree. Well, Harold, I certainly want to thank you for the time you've given, the thought that you've given to these questions. And uh, we will now try to have this uh, transcribed, get a chance to look at it. But more than that, uh, we'll have this tape put in the archives at RIT. Interested in hearing a little more about the early history of the School of American Craftsmen, your years at the Institute of Thanks very much. Well, Leo, it's uh, 20 of 12. Do you, do you uh, have a cup of coffee and uh, 